Hey guys, Coach here. Got to tell you uh, on the down low that I am pumped this morning bringing this to you because I just relived some of the band Journey's greatest hits. And when I was growing up, yeah, well, I wasn't even, I was already grown, but man, I sure did love the way Steve Perry sang. Damn, that guy could carry a note. Ha! But that's not what we're talking about here today, is it? All right, back on topic. Hey, I will tell you, first of all, what this episode is not. This is not going to be a college level landscape design course and not intended to make you a landscape design professional. Now, with that small disclaimer out of the way, here's what it is. It is an introduction to the very basics of landscape design and geared to you, the homeowner that wants to design or redesign your own yard without having to pay hundreds or thousands of dollars. We will break this into some small bites that almost anybody can learn from and do things on their own, which is what this whole channel is all about. You know, I'm really glad you joined me today. So take it from the immortal words of Optimus Prime, designers in training, roll out. Hey, I'm Matt, you can call me coach. Every Friday I bring with me landscape DIY education, concepts and theories, ideas and solutions, so you guys can go out and tackle a landscape project yourself, get professional results, save a whole lot of money in the process, and in this day and age, be a lot more self-reliant. Man, after a 20 plus year career in the green industry, I'm bringing with me a lot of knowledge and experience that I wanna share with you guys the new, modern, educated, self-reliant homeowner of today. All right, now to start this episode off, I'm gonna throw this. Here's to the all impatience out there, both on the podcast world and the YouTube channel world. Here it is, down and dirty. Since some folks out there are so impatient, they want answers immediately. No need to fast forward because here we go. Landscape designing for residential landscapes boils down to these few elements. Write them down, record it, whatever you need to do to remember them. Number one is accuracy. Number two is scale. Number three is direction. Four is budget. Five is scope of project. And lastly, needs and wants. That's it. See you next week. Okay, so. Let's delve into each one of these just a little bit, shall we? Let's start with accuracy. Accuracy starts with a few things. Accuracy starts with research, verification, transference, and realistic expectations. Taking ideas and dreams and placing them to paper in a matter that holds no accuracy is a recipe for designing disaster, overspending or underspending, and disappointment and frustration. And I will share you just a small story. Used to have a designer friend. I have mentioned him in the past. Man, was he an artiste. He was a beautiful, beautiful architect when it came to putting something on paper. It really looked like a piece of art when he was all done with colors and forms and shadows and all the things that he used to do. Very popular designer in the area that I worked. And he was a good friend. He passed away just a few years ago. But one thing that Bill did was he used to always over deliver his designs. And he never designed to someone's budget. He designed to what thought would look good and to get that wow factor when he presented his designs. And many times I, as the contractor coming in behind him, I would give estimates on his designs and people would just faint, you know, they'd bonk their head on the kitchen table as they fell because what Bill created was very, very expensive. Was it beautiful? If you could afford it. And there was one job that I did up in the foothills in Northern California on his, and it was a two phase, an immediate backyard and then a very large back backyard. And that thing probably it was $120,000 combined. And these people, they had all the money in the world, so it didn't matter. They wanted what they wanted. But for most of us, especially in the DIY world, you know, you, you kind of, you know, you kind of have a budget. So 
accuracy is more important than fluff, more important than colors. You know, it is nice to get those creative juices flowing through the pencil or pen or mouse or however you want to do it, but you have to be, you know, you have to set some realistic expectations. Well, it is through precision measurements, knowing direction, which I'll cover in a second, being realistic, being in bounds for a set budget, and designed to a skill level that you can undertake. Not maybe that what coach would take on for you if you hired me or some other reputable professional, but something that you are, this is a DIY project. Now, yeah, you can, you can grow and expand on your skill set on your own project. There's, I got no problems with that and kudos if you do, but just be realistic that you may not have something that is suitable for Pinterest or HGTV. Okay. So designed to something that is going to be a vast improvement from what you have, but maybe not quite architectural design level, somewhere, somewhere in the middle where you're comfortable with it. All right, moving on. Hey, we talked about accuracy. Let's talk about scale. Scale is one of the biggest misunderstood concepts in the design world for someone who's not in it, but is really very, very simplistic once you expose yourself to it a little bit. Scale is a form of measuring distance. Think of it that way. Measuring distance and taking that distance and reducing it to fit a drawing. That's basically scale. You're scaling down the actual dimensions onto something that will fit onto a piece of paper. Scale is achieved by understanding how feet equal inches or fractions of an inch. In other words, how a foot equals a quarter inch. There's your quarter inch scale, okay? That's what you would put on your design list. That is one example of measurement. Depending on the size of your project area, using um, the standard three-sided engineer ruler, you too can easily learn and place your landscape project on a design sheet and get that much closer to mentally understanding the scope, mentally understanding the scope and distances and committing it to a mental computer inside your head to where by the time you're done designing this thing, you have almost done it mentally in your head. That's what self-designing does for people. Now, when I was designing for folks, I would, I would go and meet with them. And these are total strangers in a total yard I've never been in before. And I would walk in there, I would get hired, we would come to a, an understanding on the price, and then I would go out and I would immerse myself into this project. Literally, I would be taking photographs, I would be taking measurements, I would be there in the morning and maybe I'd be there in the late afternoon to find out where uh, sun and shade shadows fell at the time of year that I was going to be working. And then when I went back to the drawing board and I drew something up for them, by the time I presented it, I, I was like I lived there. I was able to tell them in great detail what things are, how we were going to achieve that, and what the roadmap was to do it. And that's essentially what a design is. It's a roadmap for someone to do it and stick to it so they end up with the design's results. Now, if you end up putting sycamore trees two feet out from your patio slider, well, your design was a little weird, okay? But right plant in the right place, uh, school of thought, and designing things to scale so that when things are mature, they look spaced, equidistant, easy to maintain, able to be improved on over the years and refreshing without having to rip out two years after planting. So here's the thing about scale. And think about it for just a second. If you don't have an engineer ruler in the house, they're really easily attainable. I mean, you Amazon it and have it the next day. You can go down to Staples and buy one right over the counter, no problem. But here's how scale is. How many feet are in an inch if you're using a quarter inch scale? Think about it a second. If a foot equals a quarter inch, then one inch equals four feet. Two inches equal eight feet. If you're using eighth inch scale, an inch equals eight feet. Two inches equals 16 feet. Now I have used eighth inch scale. The smaller the scale you're using, probably the bigger the project you're doing. Now, if you're doing a, an oversized condominium patio, you're probably not even gonna use quarter inch scale. You may use half inch scale. You may not even need half inch scale. You know, it might be something even three quarter because you don't have a very big area, but eighth inch scale, yeah. And there's times where you have uh, an inch equals 10 feet, you know, and now, now you're really talking a much larger project, sometimes even commercial projects. So scale is very important to get right. Measure your back fence, for example, if you wanna 
you know, a down and dirty lesson. Measure your back fence if you have one. Or just measure the back side of your back wall of your house. And say you get 40 feet and you're going to use quarter inch scale. So what would that be on your engineer ruler? It would be about 10 inches, right? And you will see those numbers. You know, for instance, on the quarter inch or eighth inch scale on the ruler itself, on one side you'll have quarter inch, on the other end you'll have eighth inch, and you'll have two rows of numbers that go by each other on that. That is the actual lengths that you're going to be measuring for. If you got a, four, a, a 40 foot wall, then you're going to measure out 10 inches, and there it is. There's the number 40 right below it on the quarter inch scale. Most of the time when I was designing, most of the time, I used what they called architectural D-sized design sheets. And that's basically 24 inch by 36 inch sheets. Uh, for some of the larger projects, I went architectural E, which was 36 by 48. But then I also had a lot of other things on the design sheet besides just the lot and all the, the plant material and the design itself. There was legends, there was uh, suggestions, there was planning diagrams, there was irrigation stuff. There was all kinds of things on the perimeter where everybody would be able to look at it and go, wow, or, you know, and, and they'd look at the, the plant thing and the, the legend would show either by a call out, which I'm getting a little too technical on you now, but uh, say the number two, they would go to the legend and they'd say, oh, number two is a redwood tree. Okay. You know, and they'd be able to walk their way through it. I used to call it the digesting process. After someone, they, they would look at the design and they go, oh, wow, this looks really good. But they really don't know what they're looking at yet. It's going to take them a couple of three days, literally sitting down with a cup of coffee and then comparing and then researching the plants that I've suggested for them. So when they were ready to commit to a job, they understood it almost as well as I did. So anyway, scale, scale, very, very important. Let's talk about direction. Direction and what I'm speaking about is the compass direction. It's really important. Getting this right will allow you and any others to discern what exposure the project will be facing. And what I mean by that is north, east, south, or west. If you hired a designer to come in and design your front yard and your front yard basically faced north and so you had a majority of the year where a lot of your front yard was kind of shady and in the winter time maybe all the yard was shady but your designer came in and put in a bunch of full sun things you would know that ah, yeah they didn't get the compass direction right at all they really didn't so wherever your project might be you need to know hey my backyard is south southwest that's that's the exposure. Now you can go chase plant material and shade structure and other elements that are going to fill the bill for that southwest exposure. Maybe you need wind breaks. Maybe you need any number of things. But on the front side of your house, which is the northeast, totally different animal. You know, you, your house may be your windbreak and you need uh, navigable walkways to get to your front door. You need walkways to go around to the backyard. You may need shade loving plants or maybe you have a, a full grown tree out there already and you need to plant underneath it and around it to make everything look nice. There's a lot to, even though it sounds very simplistic, there's a lot to that getting it right. And the way I used to always get it right and the way I would tell people when I presented is to look at the rosetta. And a rosetta is just a drawn symbol somewhere on the design that pointed north. And it was usually always up. That's kind of the industry standard. So you oriented your design on the paper with the north pointing up. So the top of the design was generally always the northern exposure. Just something to remember. A rosetta can be nothing more than an arrow. You'll, you'll see it on the YouTube channel. Just look at them. I mean, there's, there's a bazillion of them, however you want to use it. So remember, the reason direction is so important is that you're placing the right plant material in the area. And maybe some windbreak and shade structures and other things that you're going to need. Okay, moving on. Moving on to budget, I don't know how many times I've talked about this over the last three years. I've stated it over and over and over again. Design to your set budget. Don't budget to your design, period. Next. Designing a $100,000 landscape, either by yourself or having a professional do it, is a great exercise in creativity, and it generates a lot of excitement and interest. But if that is, that $100,000 is... $90,000 more than you could ever possibly afford. <laughs> why, why bother? 
I mean, it, what, what do you want to do? You want to you want to frame it and put it on your wall in your man cave? Man, I look at this design, boy. This thing is the greatest. No, no, I no, I can't afford it. I can't put it. But man, it sure does look good on paper, doesn't it? Well, for a DIYer, that's just an exercise in futility. Now, with that being said, and for all the trolls that come crawling out of their holes, the only exception to that is if your project that you're designing for yourself is projected to be done over many phases over several years. And for instance, in a rural piece of property, you have someone build your house on your five acre lot. And there's a lot of field and au natural out on the perimeter, but someday that might be orchard, barn, uh, horse corral, cattle, pasture, whatever. You know, then your design can be however big you want to make it. And then when you actually take the initial phases on, consider those futuristic things when you're doing your initial, maybe your your small front yard and your backyard so that you have a place to call home, so to speak. Place to go out and sit on a patio instead of just dirt. But your design, your roadmap has told you that you're going to run electrical conduit to where your backyard patio is because your shade structure that's going in next year will need to be lighted, but you're also going to take that underground utility and run it and stub it out where your barn's going to be in three years. You see what I'm saying? So yeah, most, and I would say 90% of DIY landscape designs focus on the immediate and not the five and 10 year plan when it comes to overall stuff because we we live on smaller lots we don't live on 10 acre properties or whatever so for most folks doing their own landscape design it's because they have something in their immediate future they're going to be doing it this coming spring and they're going to be doing it on a twelve thousand dollar diy budget not a forty thousand dollar professional budget they have gauged it to that budget and they're going to do their damnedest to stay in there so they're not eating pork and beans plain and simple design to the budget and stick to it it will certainly lower your stress levels when you undertake the project it has set realistic expectations and goals for you by designing it to this even if you bring in the pros to help you tell them straight up hey i've got a budget you know and your irrigation work is a majority of my budget but the rest of it i'm gonna do myself not only will you come across as a more knowledgeable customer and one not to be trifled with, you're also going to be someone that is going to be uh, monitoring and understanding what's going on there. Okay, moving on to the next one, scope. Evaluating the size and breadth of the project is critically important. If you are on an acre of bare land, like I mentioned earlier, and your design calls for three quarters of that acre to be landscaped, and you have set yourself a budget of $20,000, you might be a little disappointed when you come to find out that, hey, your driveways, walkways, and everything just blew that whole $20,000 budget. You know, especially if you had someone come in and finish it for you. Maybe you can form it up. Maybe you can do that. I did. And then I had other people come in and finish it because I liked concrete, but I was not in love with concrete by any way, shape, or form. We were just buds, and that was about as far as that relationship would ever go. Just didn't like it. But heck, I could form with the best of them. Depending on how fancy that three quarters of an acre is intended to be, mm, you know, you're probably going to fall short. You know, back in 2017, I was called upon to design, and then I was also contracted to redo almost two acres of new well it was an existing house but the the yard no one ever did anything with the yard there really wasn't anything there except some euonymus right by the front door that was really the only landscape in the whole place and it was a combination of fancy shade structure lots of concrete work lighting big backyards, walkways out of decomposed granite, a fire protection sprinkler system, a dam uh, for water retention and a pump to pump into 10,000 gallons worth of uh, firefighting water storage capacity, five horsepower Honda pumps. I mean, my God, this thing went on forever. But he was a retired dot comer and he had more money than God and it didn't matter. A three hundred and twenty-five thousand dollar budget didn't set him back. 
I mean, he just started writing checks and he got what he asked for. He really did. Now, that was one of my last projects I ever did and certainly the largest that I ever did. And that was, those were $2017. That was back then, before COVID, before all the, the spike in prices because of supply chain issues, you know? So I can't imagine what that job would have cost now. It would probably be closer to half a million, really. You know, being realistic, uh, being informed and being ahead of the curve mentally will keep you ahead of the letdowns and possible failures of your landscape project. You can do it. I say all the time, you go to work 40 plus hours a week and you do what you do because you're good at it, you know it, you've been trained at it, and you're knowledgeable about it. Well, before you take something like this on, spend some time. Get a little education underneath your belt. That's what this whole channel is about. And it will alleviate those letdowns and failures. In this example, maybe small areas front and back for now with plans for expansion later is a much more realistic approach that will lead to DIY success, plain and simple. I'm here to get you over the finish line and get you over the finish line, still married, still enjoying life, no casts on any limbs, no stitches on any faces, none of that. It's supposed to be a good journey. Okay, last one. Needs and wants. Needs and wants will extrapolate from all the other segments of this episode. It will extrapolate from accuracy, scale, scope of project, etc. Needs and wants, I call your attention to needs first, always and fill in with wants as you can afford, either initially or over time. Do you need to pay attention to drainage in the landscape before any fancy play sets for the kids or play areas because your backyard is so freaking flooded when it rains an inch of water that you couldn't put a kid's play area out there anyway? So your needs should be right focused, laser focused on making sure that the place drains out and it's graded correctly, you know, and you don't have brown swimming pool puddles out there that uh, frogs like to, you know, hang out in in the springtime. So, do you need an outdoor patio? One that is graded correctly, big enough for the family now and five years from now? Or do you, you know, your wants is, I want a really nice landscape lighting project and to be able to uplight the beautiful trees that are here now and the walkways that we're going to be putting in? <clears throat> no. No, focus on your needs first, and then the wants will come later. And you can always put in the infrastructure ahead of time. And then as your resources replenish, you've got the wire already in there, maybe for your lighting project. And all you gotta do is go out and get the fixtures. But you were able to afford the wire initially during the initial phases of your DIY project. You know, do some evaluation of your site. Again, be realistic. If you need to use 75% of your budget to address immediate needs, then that is what you need to do. No tantrums here. No, uh, I wants, I wants, I wants, but I wants. No, you need to do this first, then move on to your wants. Good, educated, and responsible homeowners do what is needed and focus on wants as time and resources allow. That's responsible home ownership. Don't go buy a new car when you got a leaky roof. Okay, plain and simple. Okay, so on the channel this week, you will have a lot more stick figures, photographs, pictures, my ugly mug, etc. cetera. It'll kind of bring this even more home together. I'll show you the engineer ruler and I'll show you some uh, drawing and designing out on the table, etc. So I hope you can join me over there. If you would like to help us out just a little, for helping you out a lot and check out many of the tools and suggestions that we have on our new Amazon storefront. You might want to check it out. We got a link below. Check it out. No pressures, but hey, every little bit helps. And don't be one of those kikes that just want to take, take, take. You know, pay for some good information. I think I give it every single week. Hey, you know something? That's what I got for DIY landscape designing basics. Can't get much more simpler than that. Listen to me more than once here on the podcast if you want to re-solidify maybe parts that I breezed over or I didn't linger on long enough for you. Not only that, but you can always email me any questions. 
youryardcoach at gmail.com. I appreciate you listening, and I appreciate you over on the channel if you watch. As always, to your guys' landscape success, and I will see you guys next week. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to the Yard Coach Podcast. Don't forget to head over to the website at youryardcoach.com where you will find more DIY landscape education, including the free 15-step DIY landscape checklist, Coach Matt's ebook called Landscaping Simplified, and the flagship digital course, Homescape 1.0. As always, if you have any questions or comments, you can email Coach Matt directly at youryardcoach at gmail.com. We'll see you right here next week.